Okay, well, um, thank you very much, both uh, Bradley and uh, Petran, for uh, these uh, interesting uh, um, talks. And I'm uh, actually, I thought I was going to sit, but I might just walk around between you. That's more convenient. Um, it's very interesting, and um, also, of course, in, the, in, in, in some differences and uh, similarities. I think that what I found interesting is this idea of meaning and how you convey meaning in this field of art and science and whatever. And I, uh, of course, the artistic cognition uh, concept is uh, uh, very interesting. Um, I wonder, for I see that as you work, you have um, puts meaning in your work. I, I, some, I had the idea that how you think about um, the uh, documentation of your work is actually uh, comparable to creating meaning uh, which is more general as it is in, in science, for instance. Because you do, for instance, you do these things that are very personal uh, experiences and you need forms of documentation to make them more general in some way. But it, it, that's a different way of conveying meaning to me than uh, what, what, for instance, uh, Petron gave us examples of uh, either it's the symbolical uh, uh, way of going uh, uh, for a certain uh, Things uh, I, or I, the I can answer for him here in the first place. <laughs> oh, are, you, are we going to answer? Uh, it's no, the no, question. I want to say what I, what yeah. I, I forgot <laughs> Good. to say. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to say what, uh, what uh, the relevance is. I, if, if I see uh, work of badly, I think that's uh, quite a good illustration and point because at uh, one hand it seems to be very conceptual and abstract, but on the other hand it is a complete reconstitution of all the moments that are uh, forgotten, deliberately I guess, in the scientific uh, approach, because uh, uh, flying bodily free, naked in, uh, in uh, gravitational space is something that the scientists self, themselves do not do. So what, what attracts me in your work is this uh, paradox that uh, at the one hand is very conceptual abstract, so it, it, uh, it, it meets the criteria of the scientist himself. They are just as clean, so you are not this uh, messy artist, so you are clean, conceptual, hmm. but at the same time you reintroduce uh, uh, all these forgotten moments of bodily presence, perception, how it feels, how it and you convey that to the, pub, to the public. You engage uh, the public in uh, trying to feel the same uh, and uh, feel all these forgotten moments. Is that right? Is that <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm very happy that, that that's conveyed. Um, I think given my, my kind of uh, bachelor's and master's origins mm. in aerospace engineering, I think that was the thing that I was constantly questioning is exactly what you presented, mm. the, the very narrow range of activity that actually um, uh, technical or sci scientific methodologies have access to, um, yet it's kind of the, it's become the ethos of, of kind of everything, everything wants to it seems to me everything wants to look pseudoscientific and or scientific and that it's kind of this trend where everything wants to prove its validity through scientific uh, methods and metrics such as mm -hmm. quantification and, and all the rest and um, you know I think I, I also that perspective was informed by studying art and architecture at the same time and realizing that even in the architecture discourse, it seemed like the authorship was getting farther and further removed. So that in the in the design process, architects were making dig virtual models and applying virtual forces, mm -hmm. and therefore claiming that their design was rational, and therefore that they actually weren't so much the authors of it, mm -hmm. which is total bullshit because they designed the models that produced the mm -hmm. rational outcome. So. I think, yeah, I think my, my practice is very much coming from a reflection on that and deciding as I try to present that, you know, I want to be pushing back the other way and kind of, so what if it doesn't meet the demands of a technical, rational process? There's, there's truly meaningful, uh, experiential um, things that are getting overlooked in this process. And I think that you are really propagating the clash of the cliché of the scientist, 
that is detached uh, from uh, humanity. Uh, first, uh, Both of them, you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So be careful of that, because we are embedded in the same uh, world. Also, you have the cliché of the science that is reducing is just one step. Step where you reduce to simple components so that you can understand, you can reproduce. But on the same time, now, we have science that expands our horizon. We use technology now for the first time in the history of mankind, you have a technology that helps us to look at the beginning of the universe, that allows us to understand how we are formed, understand that uh, we come out of stars, out of the Big Bang. So this expands that we have to go through one phase where you need to understand. And it doesn't mean that uh, we are detached from also perception, but it's just some part of the methodical approach to question the universe. And so, and I think it's important that uh, as an artist, we are all artists in a way, but also so the part of scientists in you, you take this into account in uh, how you are going to proceed. I don't question that science is um, trying to address very big questions and universal questions, but also individual questions. What are you made of? Sure, but your your um, the 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 approach is putting me or humanity or something as an external object to look at and observe, and the the understanding that's produced is always conveyed through quantitative measurements and metrics, and that's a very limited language that I want to question. I also want to allow for the opportunity that we can explore. Well, first of all, we can choose our methodology, so it's not necessarily one's better than another. And that would be a scientific methodology. Yeah, but just to expose okay. that you, there's a toolkit, a range that we can choose, um, and that um, it's, there's, there's a fundamentally, for me, fundamentally different way of pursuing knowledge or understanding or questioning that isn't about detaching yourself from what you're observing, but it's somehow like um, more of an internal, I mean, as soon as you start to speak about these things, they sound very cheesy and new agey, but kind of this more like introspective process, which I would argue, I haven't, at least in my experience, I haven't, I haven't seen in the scientific realm in the way that I'm talking about. There's biology that's looking in, but it's still, Place exterior, so that you can observe. What, what you what you what you talk what you're talking about? Might that be the artistic cognition that uh, Petan is uh, propagating here? Yeah. Of course, I don't want to deny the, the, the value of uh, scientific style of cognition at all, because it is uh, it has uh, given us quite a grand reach into the outer regions as well, in the far as into the body, but on nanoscale, that uh, we're talking about methodology. I'm trying to defend the artistic approach as its own form of cognition, with its own criteria. Now, in the scientific method, you make a, a difference between the context of discovery and the context of justification of theories. In the context of discovery, there are all kinds of personal ambitions and feelings and uh, uh, wonderments and, yeah, that, uh, that, uh, that the scientist has. But when the theory is presented, of course, this is all erased because the idea is that theory should be transmittable to future generations without taking recourse to the personal experience of the scientist. It's because of that that science has taken this high flight and that it is developing so fast. So that is a different method from the artistic method because they don't want to make this offer, this, uh, this sacrifice, uh, uh, because they take their um, personal longings and, and uh, fantasies uh, as the starting point for explorations into the perceptible field. So they don't have to justify their works in terms of a transmittable body of knowledge that is neutral and can be 
given through <coughs> generation. So uh, these are different styles of cognition with their own style of legitimation. So uh, it is not to deny that the, that the one is more valuable than the other, but you need them both. No, we, we don't. Uh, we don't go to value. I, I added the question of uh, uh, changing perspective. Even introspection, you have to think. What, what are we? You are sixty percent of water. Most of this water, hydrogen. That's a scientific view. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> but part of this water is hydrogen from the Big Bang. So introspection is also the universe talking through you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. and part of it is oxygen that was created in the middle of stars. So that's also the universe going through you. And that was incredible. That I we come at your face, yeah, we come nice, at your face. That's nice, but I don't like mystifying artists, but I don't like mystifying scientists either. No, <laughs> 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 it's for us. I think you're sort of hitting uh, this question of what it is to be. Uh, you know, if you are something, are you a scientist, or are you a human, or are you an artist, or are you a human, or are you both humans? Um, and uh, if you take especially sort of recent things that we've seen from, science, from the scientists, there's a much more personal approach of them that you, you find as well. Sort of, um, uh, I can think of one off my head where the shuttle is rolling over the world and, and, this, um, and one of the astronomers are take, is blogging and he's taking these uh, picture observations from the Earth, uh, of, uh, which are quite captivating, but it's also telling and it gives you insight into what it's like to be up there and, and also what it's like for a, a sci not just being a scientist, but also being a human. And I think that's quite an important, I mean, you, I think you are reflecting on it, but I think it's an important aspect that scientists are humans and, and it's always sort of spoken about as if they're not humans. And, and I think that is the reaction that we're having here. <laughs> But isn't that, isn't that uh, a change in how scientists present themselves instead of a change on how science works or evolves? I think you are all scientists. Just I think we're all, I agree. <laughs> I think we're all artists too. <laughs> Which, um, yeah. Of course the scientists are human, and that's why I think it's such a pity when, when, when it happens that they only speak through a very narrow channel. So just as Hess was talking about liberating technology, which is something I feel very close to as well. I think there's, I, mean, I think part of my agenda is to liberate the scientists from this <laughs> very limited range of, that, of, of, of ways of validating what they do. I mean, when it comes down during our workshop, the issue of like the institutions that we work in has come up. When it comes down to like funding mechanisms and all the rest, even though the scientist I visited at CERN is fascinated by particle physics just because of the feelings, he doesn't go to the funding body to say this. He, he talks about the spin-off technologies that maybe are possible down the road. It's the same thing with space, which I don't believe is a rational endeavor. I think it's an art project. Um, but, um, so, you know, so it's not liberating. We, we just uh, together in this uh, endeavor. Um, <laughs> I'm not denying that the scientists are human, of course we are all human. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to pit uh, professional roles over against each other. It is not so that you have at one end a scientist, you have, we are not born artists or scientists. These are cognition styles that you can adopt. So I can be, when I enter the art field, I can manifest myself as an artist or a philosopher or a scientist if I'm prepared to bring the sacrifice to make these studies and uh, make myself uh, uh, competent to uh, do something in these fields. But I don't want to typecast them as individuals, persons, that the one is a reductive scientist and a kind of uh, not complete human and the, sci and the artist is more complete than the scientist. That, that's completely wrong. I think these are roles, cognition styles that can every individual can adopt them and sometimes they can adopt both or three of them at the same time. So, uh, so I'm not here to make a, a trench war between the different uh, styles. Okay, yes. I, I only don't like... Uh, no.
artists that present themselves as gurus, but I don't like scientists, that, and especially astronomers and physicists that present themselves as gurus either. <laughs> <laughs> or philosophers. <laughs> they are at least somewhat more modest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion and I really appreciate what you're trying to do for um, the scientific endeavor to kind of to bring this perspective to this. But I'm also a little bit irked by the, uh, by the way that it's often presented as if science, also a little bit what he has been saying, uh, that science is presented as this completely uh, rational endeavor and also that the modern science is a huge difference between modern science and postmodern science. And uh, there is no such thing as a God's eye. There is no such thing as a disembodied perspective. And there is a huge movement inside the scientific world. Uh, this is really breaking the paradigm and go, yeah, which is really uh, going on already. So there is this movement, um, yeah, within the scientific endeavor, and it's called postmodern science, more embodied science, and really looking at the bias. And I'm an anthropologist myself, and also within feminist studies, this is of course a huge deal. So yeah, there is you can connect to these kind of uh, streams or flows actually that are going towards this this new perspective, because it is really important, uh, because there's power really associated with uh, presenting knowledge as already uh, uh, there, the way that is, uh, science is productive, also Bruno Latour, you wrote uh, a bit about it. So it's really interesting to look at the way that scientific uh, knowledge is produced, and the way it's represented, and the power that is inherent in that, which is, yeah, invested in that. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to offer. As a matter of fact, I'm completely agree with you because uh, in my critique on the scientific method, I take as my uh, enemies say that it's not really so, that uh, this, this uh, disembodied kind of science, but when I try to repair the whole uh, view on cognition, of course, the view of one of the heroes, and the idea of an extended mind, if you talk about uh, technologies as extensions of the body that, that, that have to be incorporated, that all our perceptions are always instrumental, mediatized, and you can't stand outside of that. So you have to uh, embrace the world through the media and not uh, via some bypass. There is no pure or disembodied knowledge possible. So in science, you see more and more, and Bruno Latour is one of two good uh, examples of that, you see this new paradigm arising. It's not completely postmodern, it would be post-postmodern. But, <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, that, that's of course. And you see artists uh, on, uh, working along these lines as well. So you're all together. But that ties in with, with what I said just now, that. I see it as different cognition style, not, not as obsolete individuals versus enlightened uh, artists, uh, please not. This whole event is framed within art science collaborations and so it's very much like framed in that space. Um, but I think, you know, and I'm, I like the post-post modern <laughs> science practices, um, but at least at, at, in my experience in the world at large, I still see the ethos tending towards, you know, whatever field it is, including arts, we need to find like concrete, valid, uh, verifiable evidence to, to claim our existence, to find funding, etc. And so, for me, that, that diagram of like the functional, valuable, and real is, I think, a, a wider perspective on kind of the things I'm thinking about and grappling with, and science is one aspect. Um, and I would certainly, again, in my experience working as an aerospace engineer and knowing that context, and, you know, it seems like maybe the post-post, uh, 
methodology is not there yet. I mean, when the, when the resources are so limited and so rarefied and so expensive, um, I've always thought like the space endeavor is, um, it's, it's like the exercise that you might have been given in some kind of ice-breaking situation. What seven things do you bring with you on the desert island? Like, what <laughs> is worthy of the tremendous expenditure that it takes to go to space? And so far, the answer is pretty much data, like objective measurements. And for this reason, I'm excited about the space tourism industry because you're going to blow that, those bounds completely off the environment and it's something completely new and remade. Um, so just, yeah. What you're focusing on as an artist is very, I think, very, um, it's very much about the um, experience, it's very experiential. And the same problem that we're talking about that, could, that causes uh, science to, 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 uh, to focus on this very um, data objective uh, uh, um, uh, the description of itself, couldn't you say that we, we, we talk a lot about all these art and science collaborations, that it might be a problem in, 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 in art, in, in other art science combinations which then try to pull in the, 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 these critical uh, kind of uh, um, uh, social aspects more than it's just actually about the experience they want to have. Or is that the... I don't quite understand. No, maybe I'm not clear enough anymore at this hour, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> does it, well, it, it, could, it be, could it be comparable to the fact that in many art and science, I'm not talking about your work, but in many art and science uh, 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 works, you see that the art is uh, getting, the art part of it is getting its uh, 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 legitimation of the uh, of the uh, of the, the critical meaning, talking about what kind of meaning you use, uh, what kind of meaning art can uh, uh, consists of, um, which is actually then not just like in science, a bit something else than the um, the real experience that you would like to transfer, that you'd like to capture in a work. Yeah. Could you? Yeah. What do you think about your colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I actually never think of my work in terms of art science collaboration. Um, I think I have a, uh. a, a, a certainly have an evolving, continual relationship to technology, which is different than science. Um, and, um, and personally, in the world of these collaborations, I find it very hard to find like strong examples that to me speak as like strong artworks and that these days is the metric by which I gauge these projects. And I find it very problematic when the, the, the project has to be legitimized only through the backstory. Right. Um, and you know, I may or may not be falling into the same trap, but this is just mm. my perspective looking out, but I, I don't think, um, well, uh, one term that's come up in the workshops is the whole issue of critical design as something that's perhaps I'm starting to suspect that even certain of my works and, cert and plenty of the art science works that I see are actually more critical design endeavors than they are artworks. Mm. And it's because that, that critical design discourse seems to apply very well and very uh, favorably hmm. towards these interactions. I want to tell something about my own research, my own questions. Uh, I'm a philosopher of technology, and uh, one of the greatest fears of all uh, philosophers of technology in the last century, in the 20th century, was that the world would become everywhere the same. Because uh, you're everywhere spread Sony, Philips, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's. Uh, Coca-Cola, the whole is becoming one big consumption culture and the same technology is introduced everywhere, standardized and so on. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that. Uh, <laughs> of course, we have this longing in the past when in the 16th century you traveled with your sailing vessel over the earth, you found the Aztecs and the Mayas and the kingdoms in Africa, and the, 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 the emperor of China, that was uh, Indiana Jones world. Now I think that will return. 
because um, technology is not this leveling, nivelating force. Of course, it has become so, but these are uh, diseases of the beginning, uh, when mass production was introduced in the 20th and uh, the former century, of course uh, we made this uh, mass produced world. But now, after postmodernism, a lot of differentiation has uh, occurred. And now I am very much interested in anthropological, uh, cultural anthropological appropriation of technologies. Technology, when it is dispersed over the globe and it is incorporated. That was my story for discussion. Technology has to be incorporated and mediates our perception. But it doesn't do that in all cultural regions in the same way. Chinese adopt uh, technology in a different way than Africans. In the 50s uh, of the last century, when Phillips introduced the lady shape and so, they asked uh, 30 housewives here somewhere from Zola or so, and, uh, <laughs> they could uh, use it, and when they uh, found it right, it could be exported to Africa and Alaska, it doesn't matter. Now we have to take into account that on the local level, there's a lot of thinking. The do-it-yourself technologies, they pop up. Uh, artists are busy with uh, transforming, translating technology, not only in its outward appearance, but even in its functioning. Uh, in 2004, I was in Shanghai and I was testing this hypothesis. Uh, I've been traveling here to check whether uh, this is just a uh, hope or that it's really realistic. But I, I witnessed there the first uh, video art uh, exhibition in Shanghai. And a lot of Chinese curators and art historians presented their own Chinese view of video art. And they presented it as a completely different aesthetic than we have in Europe. And it was a different, not only different themes that you can capture with your video operators, but a different way of using the medium and translating the cultural experience. So I think everything in the world is differentiating again. But, of course, it is not completely a hooray story because you are not sure whether this will end up in an archipel of happy people in all different cultures or that we envision a kind of Blade Runner culture. Hmm. I think the last is very much possible as well. In Blade Runner you will see this Eli society of uh, the rich, the multinational that live on top of the high skyscrapers while deep below in the cellars and the porticos of all the houses that gather this uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, little uh, hmm. shops. Uh, all kind of little terrible cells are tinkering their own weapons. And I, I saw that in the paper a few weeks ago. There was a photograph of our Syrian uh, rebel army that uh, didn't have uh, affluence of uh, new weapons. And they were in the basement. They were also going, uh, making new concoctions. Uh, that, so that, that's possible too, that you get this guerrilla kind of uh, differentiation of technology. Now, um, uh, philosophically speaking, you have Nicky and Hart, they wrote a book about the uh, um, empire, it's called. And they envision a future, and it's, uh, it's not, not even a future in that area, it's just nowadays, that uh, nation states are obsolete. They, they act as if they have power, as if they are agents in a political sense, but as a, as a matter of fact, Monsanto and uh, Coca Cola and so on, that's more powerful. And they have a, a, a yearly turnover of money that's often very uh, multiple fa factor of what the national governments have to spend. So the world is uh, uh, run by these multinationals. But then in the interstitious, everywhere, you see this small rebel like artist communities, hacker communities that are uh, tinkering with this technology, artists uh, transforming it. And that's what my hope is vested in. So, new incorporations of technologies, uh, differentiation of technology, small scale, health, ethnological uh, uh, use of technologies. Uh, so, I think uh, we envision uh, an interesting world. As a matter of fact, it's a Chinese curse that you may be reborn in interesting <laughs> times. <laughs> I think hope is always the best to end an evening uh, with. Um, I think it's, it's 10 and the building might close at 10, so I hope we get out anyway. Um, 
I'd like to thank uh, Bradley and uh, Peton very much for this uh, wonderful evening. All you in the public, in the audience uh, too, for uh, questions and things.